Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 320th episode, we have a new sauropodomorph still catching up from dinosaurs in 2020. <laughs> there were a lot. Yes. And we have dinosaur of the day, Ardonix. But before we get into all of that, we want to thank some of our patrons. And this week we want to thank Wyatt, Jurassic Jim, Ranger Chris from Dino for Hire, Chris, Trent Carbajal, Vikram and Karthik, Naya, Diplodicate, JC, and Myco Raptor. Yeah, thank you so much for all of your support. I know we say it every week, but we always mean it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, and if you want to join our growing community, chat in the Discord with people, get some of our other perks, then check out our page at patreon.com slash inodino. So jumping into the news, I'm really trying to catch up on all these dinosaurs that I missed <laughs> in 2020 because there were so many discovered and yeah, I fell behind. I think there was something like f over 40 discovered. Yeah, I'll talk about that in my fun fact. Oh, okay. A little preview. <laughs> So I was, I was planning on covering like three or four of this episode to catch up. But then whenever I, I have these lofty plans, the first one I dig into ends up being really complicated. And that was the case this time. Not because the dinosaur itself is anything too crazy, but it's got a lot of history. And the pronunciation was kind of tricky for me. I'm trying to do a better job at pronunciation since it's a podcast and you can't see the words. So at least maybe you'll be able to say them properly. So anyway, the new dinosaur is named Columa Lumo. Hmm. I, I'm pretty sure that's how you pronounce it. It's spelled like four different ways, depending on who's writing about it. It's a common Sasutu word, but Sasutu is a pretty difficult language. It sometimes has clicks. It's got different sounds that we don't make in any of the Romance languages. Romance or Germanic. Yes, is tricky. But I'm pretty sure it's Columa Lumo, or at least more or less Columa Lumo. <laughs> the paper was published in JVP by Claire Père de Fabregue and Ronan Alain. But really, a lot of people were involved in this research before they got around to publishing it. So Columa Lumo is a sauropodomorph from Lesotho. Being from the Triassic, it's a little bit surprising that it's from Africa because most, I would say, Triassic sauropodomorphs are from South America. We talk about sauropods in general from South America all the time. Mm -hmm. But at the time in the Triassic, South America and Africa were still joined. And so was pretty much everything else with Pangaea still sort of hanging on by a thread at that point. And as a bonus fun fact, during the supercontinent Pangaea, the corresponding super ocean was called Panthalassa. Oh, because it, there's only one ocean? Yeah. It's kind of weird because there still basically is only one ocean. I mean, they're all connected. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of a double standard where when the continents are connected, even if they're weirdly off to the side, we say it's one continent, but all the oceans are still connected. But since they're not, I don't know, connected enough, we don't consider them the same ocean. I always think that's kind of weird and how like the Indian Ocean is its own thing, even though it's like widely open to other areas. But anyway, you might have heard the word thalassa before because it's the same as thalassophobia, which is a phobia that I definitely have. It's the fear of deep water especially oceans, especially when stuff comes up out of it. And you're like, oh, God, what is happening? Yeah, like whales. Yeah, whales don't actually scare me that much, actually. So maybe I don't have extreme thalassophobia. Maybe it's just I'm afraid of sharks, and that's a place where sharks can be. But yes. <laughs> and one last thing about Panthalassa before I get back to dinosaurs. Almost all of that seafloor is completely gone. It got subducted under the continental plates and then melted back into the Earth's mantle like millions of years ago. Maybe that's really where your fear comes from. Things like that can happen in the deep ocean. No, it's all about the creatures. Oh, okay. It's all about my inability to swim compared with their ability to swim and mouths full of sharp teeth. Got it. Fortunately for people that want to know about what was going on in this massive Pangaea equivalent ocean, the sea level was higher. So some of it made it above the continental plates. And for example, in the Alps, there's a bunch of Triassic marine fossils because they were under the ocean and now they've been shoved up into mountains because hmm. that kind of stuff can happen when you're working with a quarter billion years. Back to Kaluma Lumo. 
It's in the Elliott Formation in South Africa and Lesotho, which is, I think, arguably the best studied dinosaur fauna anywhere in Africa. We talk about the Elliott Formation all the time. Yeah. A lot of cool stuff comes out of there. There, Yeah, there's a, a crazy amount. But the chemcam beds are getting more popular. They are. There's also areas in Madagascar and I think Tanzania and mm. Namibia, I want to say. There are like some other spots. But I think since South Africa had some of the early paleontologists spending a lot of time there focusing on it, going way back into like the 30s, 40s, 50s, whereas places like Morocco... They had a little bit here and there, but it's really recently that they're really starting to get going. Mm -hmm. The area where Kalumalumo is from is an area where the first bones of this dinosaur probably were found in 1930. Well, there you go. You're just talking about Elliott Formation being dug up in the 30s. Yeah. So, I mean, and even this specific dinosaur has been known since the 30s, like almost 100 years. And it's in, I think it's pronounced the Maputsung bone bed. And by 25 years later, there were paleontologists working on the area. So in 1955, they were aware that there was a dinosaur in the spot and were excavating quite a bit of it. But then again, it took another 65 years Mm. (laughs) for it to finally get named. So the name they came up with was Kalumalumo, Ellen Bergerorum. And Kalumalumo, the reason I want to know how to pronounce this so badly is because it's a really cool word. It's basically the word in Sesutu for a dragon-like monster, and it sometimes also means a giant crocodile or lizard, so that it's basically the equivalent to like long in Chinese mm-hmm. or source, yeah, or dragon in Europe. So it's a really cool word, and usually it's spelled K H O L U M O L U M O, but sometimes it's spelled with D's instead of L's. Sometimes it's spelled with an X instead of the K H at the beginning. Hmm. And you'll find if you search, especially for the one that's KH with the D's, you'll find all these cryptozoology (laughs) things, because just like the episode we just feed dropped from Skeptoid, it's one of those things where people think maybe there's a dinosaur in Africa and we haven't been able to find it yet. And so Kalumalumo is one of those. Like Nessie. Yeah, just like Nessie or any of these or like the Yeti or all these weird creatures that people like to imagine exist out in nature with no evidence. So Kalumalumo is really popular in those terms. I'm guessing they probably pronounce it Kadumodumo or Kadumadumo because they usually spell with D's when they're doing the cryptozoology thing. But I digress. So the species name is Ellenbergerorum, and that's because Paul Ellenberger was one of the scientists who did a lot of the research on excavating and also studying the dinosaur between about 1955 and 1970. Maybe basically the original scientist type person. He was actually a missionary originally. Interesting (laughs) career this person had, Mm. but significant enough to the dinosaur to deserve having the species named after him. About 99% of the bones in the Maputsung bone bed are considered to be from Kalumalumo. Oh, wow. Yeah, so it's it's very much a mono-specific bone bed. Does that mean they all died together? Probably, yeah. Or is it some weird mystery like the Cleveland Lloyd Quarry and the Allosaurus? It's even more mono-specific than that because the Allosaurus actually has some other bones of animals that maybe they were preying on or something. Mm-hmm. This is basically entirely Kalumalumo. This is pretty weird, but it, it's not actually that uncommon. The ones that usually come to mind for me are Coelophysis in New Mexico. I know there's some monospecific ones there. Mm-hmm. And there's also a fair number of like Ceratopsian bone beds where people think maybe they were crossing a river and then got washed away and buried or something like that. Mm-hmm. So there are different ways where you can imagine how a group of animals would get buried together. But usually you would imagine that they were together when they were alive, too. Right. So it could be evidence of some sort of gregarious behavior with Kalumalumo. Kalumalumo has lots of previous names. It's previously been called, just generically, a new type of Euskelosaurus. It's also been called the Maputsung Beast. Hmm. And <laughs> I think Tutabolosaurus, but 
that name is considered a nomum dubium, so I didn't worry about the pronunciation as much for that one. Mm. <laughs> and the author said, This proposed binomum was inspired by the Sasutu name of the place where the first pile of bones was found, not far from the huts of the village of Maputsung, and it means Beata's mother's trash heap. Interesting. <laughs> So apparently the authors of the paper didn't like calling the dinosaur a trash heap <laughs> because they completely rejected this name. It might also be because in 1993, it was called Kalumalumasaurus, not just Kalumalumo. They added the saurus on the end of it in a PhD dissertation, but that was never actually officially published. I didn't realize that happened with PhD dissertations. I thought they were always officially published, but I guess not. Oh, yeah. We've talked about that on some of the dinosaur of the days. Oh, really? And then years later, usually it ends up being the same as what was in the dissertation or something really similar. Well, that's exactly what happened here. Yeah. But rather than doing the exact same name, they did Kalumalumasaurus ellenbergerorum. So they left the species name from that dissertation, but they just got rid of the saurus part. And I wonder if that's because Kalumalumo already means dinosaur. Yeah. So it'd be, be. Those, like dinosaur, dinosaur, <laughs> just make it dinosaur. So we have one dinosaur with two different nicknames, two different nomen dubia, and now it finally has an official name. So basically it has five names at this point. <laughs> I liked Tom Holtz's dinosaur encyclopedia approach where he just calls it not yet officially named. <laughs> yep. That was published in what, 2007? Yeah, I think so. So all of these names had been out there at that point. And Kalumalumosaurus would have been a pretty safe bet since that was in a dissertation. But good call because it ended up not being its name. Mm -hmm. Always go by the officially published names. Definitely. Yeah, because this kind of stuff, I didn't realize how often it happened, but I guess it happens all the time. The author said, quote, The remains come from a large number of individuals, making the species the most complete to date from the lower Elliot formation. End quote. That makes sense. It's a bone bed. Yes. I Since they said lower Elliot formation, it made me think there's got to be something more complete in the upper Elliot formation. And I'm pretty sure Lasutusaurus in the upper Elliot formation is much more complete. Mm. <laughs> so kind of splitting hairs a little bit there to say, well, it's the most complete of the earlier part of this formation. But in the case of the Elliot formation, it's so well understood that people do usually split it into lower and upper. So maybe I'm being a little harsh. It is very strange that this dinosaur is so complete and it took so long to name it because a lot of times dinosaurs that we cover on the show are named after just finding the first bone. They're like, look, we found a new femur. Let's mm -hmm. name a dinosaur. Yeah, but we also talk about dinosaurs that are in museums for decades. This is true. Yeah. And it might have just been overwhelming because they basically found in 1955 with the first excavation, a couple hundred bones. And they're all jumbled together mm -hmm. in a big pile and like the individuals are all mixed together. In addition to that, apparently after the first bones were excavated, the team's relationship, quote unquote, deteriorated. No, oh, no. Yeah, I think there were some researchers from Lesotho and some from South Africa. And then bones were being taken to France and other bones were like missing. And there were also some footprints that got lost over time. Oh. And I think there was like just a lot of blame and negativity happening in this group. Mm -hmm. And so things just kind of stalled. Yeah, exactly. But they did get a lot of work done despite this deteriorated teamwork. <laughs> There's a really nice diagram showing five seasons of excavation in 1955, 56, 59, 1963, and 1970. So it took them a total of 15 years on and off to excavate the area. And it easily includes hundreds of bones, if not maybe a thousand, including the fragments. It's really complicated. The drawing, I'm impressed that they managed to put this thing together because it just looks like a huge jumble of pickup sticks. Hmm. As a result of how mixed together everything is, they couldn't separate out individuals at all. Because, <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. You got fragments everywhere and it's just too hard to know. Yeah, they're like similar size and there's just zero articulation happening. Mm -hmm. So it's it's you can tell it's multiple individuals because you have lots of repeated bones. But other than that, you'd never know which what bone goes to which. Mm -hmm. So as a result, the holotype is just a single bone. It's just a complete right tibia and nothing else. It's probably because this seems to be the main bone that differentiates it from some of its other close relatives. As an example, the cross-section 
of Bleconosaurus is more triangular, whereas Kalumalumo is more oval. These are the small details that make me know I could never be a paleontologist. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but there, there were some other details, too, where Bleconosaurus, or maybe it's Bleconosaurus, also has, as they call them, stockier toes than Kalumalumo, which is something I think I'd be better at noticing. Mm -hmm. I think that you might not be giving yourself enough credit on that cross-section, though, because a triangular cross-section, that's sort of like a, a triangular wheel. Like, you'd notice that it's pointy rather than round on, like, the middle part of the bone. Mm, that's true. Yeah, maybe if I'm looking at them side by side. Yeah, I think I think you could notice. I was in the field with you. <laughs> you picked out the little eggshells from the thing we were working on. <laughs> I guess we each got our strengths. <laughs> Within the bone bed, they've got bones from most of the body, including the limbs, hips, vertebrae, and just a little bit of the skull. I'm guessing when you add it up, you've got about 90% or more of all of the bones of the animal. And that's probably why they say it's one of the most complete, if not the most complete species from the lower or early Elliot formation. But unfortunately, it is missing most of the skull, except for part of the post orbital, so sort of near the back of the head, mm. which is a huge bummer because these early sauropodomorphs, I guess they had kind of similar heads. Yeah. But just in general, I always feel like with sauropods, we're always missing those heads and I want to know what their faces look like. <laughs> <laughs> and the teeth. Yeah, exactly. To figure out the size of Kalumalumo, they scaled it based on Platiosaurus, and literally all you do to do that is you multiply the femur length by 10, and you've got the animal length. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually how a lot of scaling of dinosaurs is done. And when they, so when they give you these crazy precise numbers, like it's 31.7 meters long, it's like their femur was 3.17 meters, and they mm. just multiplied it by 10. It's like, this is why I round everything, because I don't want to give this false sense of accuracy. So when you multiply it out, the longest femur is a little bit under a meter. So they estimated about nine meters or 30 feet long as an adult. That's pretty big. Yeah, it's actually quite long for a Triassic dinosaur. And in one place, they call it clearly bipedal, which makes the scaling with Platiosaurus a little more valid, I suppose. It's another sauropodomorph that's considered bipedal. But in another place, it's interesting because when they're trying to figure out how much it weighed, they based it on femur circumference and they gave body mass estimates in the range of two to four tons and said that depends on whether it was bipedal or quadrupedal, which I thought was kind of weird because if you say it's clearly bipedal in one spot, why would you be using weight estimates for if it was quadrupedal? Mm. I thought that was kind of weird. So if it was bipedal, it was probably closer to two tons. If it was quadrupedal, I guess it could be up to four tons which still makes it on the heavier end of sauropodomorphs, especially for the Triassic. And, quote, one of the heaviest terrestrial animals at the end of the Triassic, end quote. So not too many predators, at yeah. least once it was adult-sized. Exactly. And really starting to get on that larger sauropod sort of scale. And I think it's interesting that basically not even just for dinosaurs was it the heaviest. It's the heaviest of anything on land, period. Mm -hmm. It's really, there's your rise of sauropods. It's an indication of what's to come. Exactly, yeah. Kalumalumo is a close relative of Sarasaurus and Xingxiolong. I didn't know about Sarasaurus before. I kept thinking it was supposed to be Saharasaurus, but it's just named after a woman whose first name is Sarah. They named it Sarasaurus. That's fun. <laughs> I, you never see dinosaurs where the generic name is just a person's first name with Saurus after it. Well, isn't that what Xing Xiolong is, basically? Actually, never mind. When I looked it up, it said it refers to a bridge. Yeah, that's a little more common, naming the generic side after like a place or a significant thing about that individual, and then using the, the species name as the name of, the, of a person if you want to honor somebody. But I would like I could go for a Garrettsaurus. That's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> Sabrinosaurus. It rolls off the tug better. <laughs> that sounds funny. I could go for <laughs> this thing named after me. Yeah, pretty nice. <laughs> In any event, Sarasaurus is from the Jurassic of North America, and Xing Xiolong is from the Jurassic of China. So now we've got the three cl closest relatives are from 
North America, China, and South Africa slash Lesotho. But also in different time periods. Yeah, that's a good point. The other two are in the Jurassic. So it's pretty weird. It's in a group between Platyosauridae and Massospondylidae. And the authors say, quote, it's nested deep among other non-sauropod and sauropodomorphs, suggesting that it is not linked to the origin of sauropoda, end quote. Okay, so this group maybe multiple times evolved to become big. Yes, exactly. Because these authors, it's nice to see they're actually not over-exaggerating Kalumalumo being linked to the origins of dinosaur groups. I feel like every time we cover an old dinosaur, there's this big emphasis on, oh, it's old, and therefore maybe it's showing the origins of this or that or whatever. It's like, no, it's big, mm-hmm. and it's big for a late Triassic dinosaur, but then it seems like that family tree sort of petered out, and there was a different branch that actually led to the eusauropods. To be fair, none of those papers ever say, oh, it's definitely part of it. It's, yes. al- it's always conjecture. And I think sometimes I get excited about it and just add that on my own, too, Mm. (laughs) (laughs) because it's always you always want to know where things come from. And you don't want to just think about dead ends that happen all the time in Mm -hmm. evolution. But we know a lot about it and it's really cool. I'm sure there will be some mounts of it at some point, or at least it will be used to fill in some gaps in other dinosaurs since we have such a good fossil record of Kalumaluma. Yay, sauropodomorphs. (laughs) Yeah. Speaking of sauropodomorphs. And I'll get to that in a second. First, thank you, everybody who shared this one with us. It's, it's kind of big news and exciting. So Massachusetts is looking to name a state dinosaur. State Representative Jack Lewis is proposing legislation, and he's filing it on January 15th. So before that, if you're a resident of Massachusetts, you can vote which dinosaur to choose to represent your state. And the two options are Ankysaurus polyzelis, which was a sauropodomorph, there you go, found in 1855 in Springfield, Massachusetts, and Padocosaurus holyokensis. That's a seal physoid that was found near Mount Holyoke in 1910 by Mignon Talbot, the first woman to name and describe a dinosaur. At first I thought that said Podunkosaurus. Like it's from a podunk town. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I would go for Padocosaurus, because who needs another sauropodomorph as a state dinosaur? I see. Actually, I'm not sure if there are any sauropodomorphs. I can't think of any off the top of my head. Plus coelophysis in New Mexico. So I guess there is already at least one coelophysoid. Yeah. The history behind Podocosaurus is cool, though. Do tell. Well, the woman who named it was the first woman to name and describe a dinosaur. Oh, I I totally missed it when you said that. (laughs) (laughs) That is awesome. And that was in 1910, too. Yeah. Well done. Well done. Getting somebody to publish it is the main thing back then. Yes. Because there were lots of women working in paleontology, but then they had to use husbands' names or brothers' names, things like that, for a long time. And in other dinosaur news, in Schenectady, New York, the mall there called Via Rotterdam has a new exhibit called Via Dino Discovery. It's open seven days a week, and they've got 12 animatronic dinosaurs and interactive displays, including looks like Brachiosaurus, Stegosaurus, Triceratops, Parasaurolophus, Chidi Potty, and T Rex. At least that's what I saw in the pictures. And you can buy tickets online. You'll need to wear masks and social distance when you're there. Also, got a really fun quick story about a man, Andre Bison, or Bison. And he's a dad who thought he bought a small dinosaur for his son last Christmas, but it turned out to be 20 feet high and weigh over 4,000 pounds. What? <laughs> Yeah. What was his budget that you could accidentally buy something that weighs two tons? He didn't say. (laughs) But Tamba Park in New Jersey closed. And when they did, they sold all their dinosaurs. And he said he called them up and he asked them how big one of the dinosaurs was. And they said they didn't know, but it was as pictured. Because it was so big, it took a while to figure out their shipping logistics. So in the meantime, they sent over a three-foot-tall dinosaur. And then January of 2020, they delivered the dinosaur by crane. 4,000-pound one, yeah. (laughs) So now they call that dinosaur Chaz. I think it's a Carnotaurus. Oh, cool. That's what it looks like to me. I would have been so pumped if when I was a kid, my dad had bought me a 20-foot-high, 4,000-pound Carnotaurus. Yeah. And... He spent the year jazzing up Chaz. Jazzing up Chaz. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So 
if you walk by, there's a sensor to trigger movement. And Chaz can also roar and apparently do karaoke, but I'm not sure how the karaoke works. There was no explanation. It's probably just the same speaker that makes it roar. Mm. You plug a mic into it and then your voice comes out of that speaker. Oh, that would be fun. Yeah. I think what would be the most fun is climbing on it. Because whenever it's somebody else's dinosaur, you're not allowed to climb on it. Oh, I see. But since it's yours. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I put a little saddle on it. Oh, gosh. (laughs) (laughs) Saddle and a ladder. I'd be sitting on it all the time. We don't have room. (laughs) (laughs) We got room in the front yard. (laughs) No. No, we don't. (laughs) Uh, Imagine how good it would be on Halloween, too. You could dress it up all spooky. You could cover it in Christmas decorations in the winter. You could have a different theme for every season. Yeah, it's really fun to imagine. You could make it like an Easter bunny. Actually, not an Easter bunny. You'd make it like a a newly hatched chick since Mm. they're dinosaurs. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. What fun images to ponder (laughs) and do nothing else with. (laughs) That is so cool. I'm so jealous of this Carnotaurus. (laughs) Anyway, the last dinosaur news item for this week is Android Central published a review of the VR game Jurassic World Aftermath. Have you heard of that one, Gary? I haven't. Yeah, so neither of us have played it, but it sounds intense based on this review. So it's based two years after Jurassic World, and you play as Sam, who's this security expert and professional smuggler who goes to Isla Nublar to gather research data. You're being paid to do this. Your pilot's been eaten, your co-adventurer has a broken leg, and there's three velociraptors trying to kill you. Oh, boy. So according to the review, it's, quote, horrendously terrifying yet addictive, and I guess the visuals are really beautiful. It's good VR design, though the one of the criticisms is that the, quote, raptors aren't exactly brilliant. Mm. And that means because they patrol areas more than they are actually hunting you. And also only half of the story is available so far. The rest is coming out sometime this year. But the game is all about stealth and solving some puzzles. And according to the review, it does a good job of people who get motion sickness, just kind of the way the VR is designed. So the review said, don't buy, though, if you scare easily, because the genre is survival horror. So I found a little bit about it on some other sites, too. On the website Open Critic, where people average results of critics, it says 20% of critics recommend. Not exactly a stellar Mm. report there, but it does look pretty cool. It's sort of cartoony, more so than you would expect for a survival horror game but i guess the fact the dinosaurs are coming at you mm-hmm. and it's in virtual reality is enough to make it intense you have to do a lot of hiding too and waiting for the rafters to pass oh you. that makes sense oh yeah it looks kind of like the kitchen scene that's interesting hmm. i've never watched jurassic park and thought if only i could have a vr experience where <laughs> i'm trapped in this kitchen with these <laughs> monsters trying to eat me <laughs> And I remember when I first got an Oculus Rift, I thought, I will never play a survival horror game in this thing because it will give me the most vivid nightmares ever. And like I just regular survival horror games where you're looking at a screen and you have a controller Mm -hmm. are a lot to handle in VR. It's everything is so much more intense. Just (laughs) there's no way. So I'm not even sure if we could get it because some of the things I'm seeing say that it's an Oculus Quest exclusive, Mm. which is the new Facebook login required nonsense that they came out with. And we have the old Rift, which plugs into a computer. So I don't know if we could get it. I don't know if I even want to get it. (laughs) (laughs) I guess I'll, I'll check it out if I can. Maybe you can record me getting seriously scared and get a funny gif out of it or something. Oh, gosh. (laughs) It's an interesting idea for a VR game. Yeah, I totally understand how they came up with it. I'd prefer to like Sorian wanted to do where you are a VR dinosaur itself. Mm -hmm. And like you can be a dinosaur. That sounds fun. That could also be scary, too, if you end up being the prey. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) These dinosaur games like Path of Titans, too, where you get to choose what dinosaur you are and the options are like, something that gets eaten or mm-hmm. something that does the eating. Uh, as much as I love ankylosaurs, I don't know if I want to play as an ankylosaur in VR and just like pretend to eat grass and then fight off predators. It seems way more fun to play as the predator. Mm, maybe, but you could also have maybe some interspecies fighting or 
I don't know, mating dances or something. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. That could be cool. I think I'd at least want to be something quick though. Being mm-hmm. like a slow quadruped seems pretty dull. No, oh, interesting. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is you think ankylosaurs are dull. They're not the only slower quadrupeds. But they're not so big that nothing's coming after them. But they're so armored, nothing's coming after them. Mm. <laughs> Things try to flip them over. Okay. Do your dinosaur of the day. <laughs> <laughs> And our dinosaur of the day is Ardonix, a sauropodomorph. <laughs> that was on accident, but I like how it worked out. This was a request from Paleo Mike 716 VR Patreon and Discord, so thanks. So Ardonix was a basal sauropodomorph that lived in the early Jurassic and what is now Free State, South Africa, in the Elliott Formation. Well, what do you know? What do you know? It had a small head and a long neck and tail and a large body. It was both bipedal and quadrupedal, though it mostly moved on two legs. And its arms have features in between prosauropods and sauropods. It helps to show how sauropodomorphs had features that eventually made sauropods quadrupedal. And it shows that sauropods started walking quadrupedally much earlier than previously thought. So, Ardonix, the forelimbs were shorter than the hind limbs. They're about 72% of the length. However, the forearm bones interlocked, just like sauropods that walked on four legs, and the femur was straightened to support weight, and its feet were flat with large claws. So it had a slower, more powerful walk than other basal sauropodomorphs. And it had short, stout feet that were more robust than more basal sauropodomorphs. It's related to the closest known group of obligatory quadrupedal sauropodomorphs, too, yeah, Ardonix is a lot closer related to what would become Eusauropods in the distant 50 million years later type time range than Kaluma Luma was. Mm-hmm. So this is one of those cases where it's like shows origins is true. Ardonix also helps show the transition to sauropods bulk browsing. It had narrow V-shaped jaws, which were a little different. Sauropods later had broad U-shaped jaws, and that was so they could take wider bites. There's no lateral ridge at the back of the dentary, and that means it didn't have, you know, fleshy cheeks, and it could open its mouth wider for bulk browsing, so the beginnings of bulk browsing. However, the more derived sauropodomorph, Chinchakiangosaurus, had U-shaped jaws and fleshy cheeks, and that may mean that the wide, cheekless jaw could have evolved a few times in sauropods. So this is all based on that ridge in the dentary being assumed as an attachment point for some sort of cheek muscle. Mm Mm-hmm. And also the V-shaped jaws versus the U-shaped jaws. Mm. The type and only species is Ardonix celeste, and the genus name means earth claw. That's named for the large earth-encrusted claws, which were some of the first fossils of the dinosaur found. (laughs) I feel like earth-encrusted could be applied to all fossils. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And the species name is in honor of Celeste Yates, who prepared a lot of the fossil material. Nice. It was described by Adam Yates and others in 2010, and the holotype includes part of the left maxilla, and there's referred specimens that include skull elements, vertebrae, ribs, and parts of the limbs. They found two individuals, they were disarticulated, and both individuals are thought to be under 10 years old based on their growth rings. These individuals were found together, mostly undisturbed, so it's possible they drowned in a flash flood. Ardonix is estimated to be about 23 feet or 7 meters long, though adults may have been bigger, since, based on histological analysis, both these juveniles were thought to be still growing. And Ardonix lived in an arid desert with streams and oases. It's nice. At least I had some oases to look forward to. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right before the flash flood. Yeah. Whoops. And our fun fact of the day is that There were about 48 new dinosaurs published this year. Eh, I knew it was more than 40. We said last year there were about 47 new dinosaurs published in 2019. Hmm. So I guess we're still, we haven't reached peak dinosaur yet. We're still increasing, potentially. I wonder how COVID affected that, though. Like if more dinosaurs got published because people were stuck in their offices and they had time to catch up on writing. Hmm. Or were fewer published because... You couldn't go out in the field that much. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. So we'll have to see next year. Hopefully we get it. I want to make it to an even 52 so that I can actually say 
there's one dinosaur discovered every single week rather than just almost a dinosaur discovered every week. (laughs) (laughs) Some of them are discovered in the same week, though. That's true. And the number also varies quite a bit based on online versus print publication dates. So like, yeah, and what date exactly it was discovered on is kind of weird because like we were talking about with Kaluma Lumo, it was found in 1955, basically. So yeah, anyway, I digress. The standard is based on when it was published, because that how else can you really define when a dinosaur was named? This includes a couple of species that were put into an existing genus, like Allosaurus Jim Matsoni. That was in 2020. That seems like five years ago at this point. It does. <laughs> but Allosaurus Jim Matsoni was published in 2020. And Omasaurus Puxiani, I think. We haven't covered that one yet. On that note, we have about 12 left to describe after today, 11, but <laughs> still quite a few left to describe going to try to get through those as fast as possible though yeah because the 2021 dinosaurs are already coming i know i know it's it's a lot <laughs> <laughs> and that wraps up this episode of i know dino thanks for listening don't forget to subscribe in your favorite podcast app so you don't miss out on any new episodes and join our community patreon.com slash i know dino thanks again and until next time Good day.